What I wanted to talk about was as living with low vision. And most of you in this room either are affected by low vision or are living with somebody or know somebody that has low vision. So raise your hand if you have low vision or a vision impairment. And raise your hand if you are a support person or a family member or a caregiver. Okay. It's a good amount of people. So you're in the right group, you're in the right place, and we're gonna talk about living with low vision. So here's the diagnosis. This thing just... There we go. So there's Murph with his sunglasses on. You'll notice he's wearing sunglasses. He has worn sunglasses since he was uh, four months old, and he still wears them to this day, and so thank goodness he doesn't have cataracts yet. But anyways, so the diagnosis is, the doctor has told you you have low vision, or maybe it's macular degeneration or glaucoma or some type of disease that's affecting your vision. How many of you, when you went to the doctor and you were diagnosed with a low vision disease, expected to have that diagnosis? Not too many, okay, a few of you. How many of you thought that when you went to the doctor's office, because you couldn't see well, he, was going to pers he or she was going to prescribe for you a pair of glasses, make it better. Yep. And how many of you thought, well, maybe I might have to have some surgery? And how many of you thought maybe the doctor's just going to give you some kind of an eye drop and you're going to be able to see better? Okay. So typically that's what happens is you go to the eye doctor because you've been having some vision problems. You can't see real well, maybe things aren't as clear, maybe... Um, Something's a little distorted, but the last thing you expect is the doctor to tell you, there's nothing that I can do for your vision as far as giving you some glasses or doing surgery or prescribing some eye drops. Does that sound pretty fair for most of you? Okay. So how many of you could even spell macular degeneration when you were diagnosed with macular degeneration? You know, and over the years, we've changed the name. You know, originally, years ago, when I first started in this business, about 30 years ago, we used to call it senile macular degeneration. And that's because all these old folks were coming in and they couldn't see, so we just decided they were senile and we called it macular degeneration. So since then, we've taken that name senile off of there because basically we can have macular degeneration almost at any age. It depends on the diagnosis, but... So we've taken senile off. And now, then it became age-related macular degeneration because we started to notice that people, as they mature, I don't like to say get older, but as they mature, we're starting to have some vision impairments. Well, we've kind of changed that. We don't use age-related much as more as we will say AMD um, or MD. That's, we, we abbreviate anything in our office, MD. So I still get people calling or coming into the office and they'll say, I have that like immaculate disease or I have that degenerative disease. So there's all kinds of things that come out. But for the most part, most of you, when you were diagnosed, did not know what macular degeneration was, how to spell it. And then the next thing you wanna know is what does that mean? And what's the first thing that when you heard that diagnosis, what's the first thing that went through your mind? Anybody, anybody wanna throw out something to me? Blindness. Typically, that's what the first thing somebody thinks is, oh my goodness, I'm going to go blind. How many of you thought that? And remember, you can raise your hand because people, half the people in this audience can't see you. <laughs> so here's what happens. You get this diagnosis, and the first thing you think is, uh-oh, I'm going blind. So then what's the next thing, though? After you kind of start to realize that maybe you're not going to go blind, then what do you do? So now what? What, what happens? Any? It ain't going to happen to me. This can't be happening to me. Or maybe that doctor doesn't know what he or she's talking about. Or this is going to pass. And it's all typical reactions. It's human reactions. It's perfectly fine. But we also get to that point that we have to come to reality. And we come to that point to, now what are we going to do? And that's the hard part, because we are creatures of habit. God created us to be creatures of a habit, and it's so hard to break a habit. So you're used to being able to jump in your car, drive to the store, you're used to be able to go shopping and pick up an item and read the contents or the price tag on it. 
or more importantly, a lot of people, what will happen is um, they realize that they're not going to be able to read. And the two most important complaints that I get that people worry about when they're diagnosed, particularly with macular degeneration, is reading, and what's the other one? Driving. So let's just take a poll, just because I'm trying to make you exercise a little bit here and do some arm exercises. If you had to give up reading versus driving, how many of you would give up reading so that you could still drive? Okay, and how many of you would give up driving so you could continue to read? Now, amazingly, unless I was wrong, Keith, I think there was more for this response that you would give up driving so you could read. And that's a hard thing. And, you know, it's a hard thing for somebody like myself or the doctor to tell you that, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to drive anymore. Um, it's a sense of independence. You know, when we were 16, what did we want to do? We wanted to get that stinking little card that said we were, had a driver's license, right? And for some reason, we think that it's a right to drive versus a privilege to drive. And in order to have a privilege, you have to meet certain requirements. And unfortunately, when you have a vision impairment, sometimes we get to that point where we're not able to drive. However, the hardest thing for most of you when you can't drive, what's the next hardest thing to do when it comes to driving? Giving up your license, but what else? Correct. Having to ask somebody to take you somewhere else or relying on somebody else to be your transportation. Because again, we've gotten so used to being able to just jumping in the car, going when we want. Now we got to start asking. So now it's like when we were 14 and we had to ask our mom or dad to take us someplace. Again, it's that giving up that independence. And that's usually what happens when we look at it. If we look at the whole picture of everything here, the diagnosis of a low vision disease is number one, it's a nuisance or it's a pain. But the other thing is that we have to give up our independence. And that's what we think. We think, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to do this, I'm not going to be able to do that. But I got news for you. You can still do that stuff, it's just you have to do it a different way. And like I just said a little bit ago, we're creatures of habits. And so for 50 years I've done something the same way it is very hard to change that habit. But I do have words for you. You can teach an old dog new tricks. And I can teach you how to read differently and still read. I can teach you how to shop, but it's a little different. I can't teach you to drive. For most uh, cases, driving is kind of one of those obsolete things. That it's um, not something that we can, can bring back. But the other thing that I have to teach you is what? What do you think I have to teach you? What else? What was that over here? Compensate. Okay, how to compensate. What else? Acceptance. Independence. Re-educate. Okay. Well, here's what happens. Oops. Here's what happens. First of all, we go through a series of emotions. And the first one, typically, even though we won't admit it, is shock. Just kind of like we said before, oh, that can't be me. That can't be happening to me. Then we go through anger. How many of you got angered? All right, I got angered. How many of you got angry when the doctor told you your vision impairment couldn't be improved? Okay. Any of you go into shock? Okay. All right. How about denial? How many of you denied that you had a vision impairment? And you know, and denial can also be not that you've denied you have it, but a lot of people will not tell somebody else that they have a vision impairment. A lot of people won't even tell their own family members. They kind of fake it until it gets to that point where at some point they do have to admit that they have a vision impairment. The other one is embarrassment. Anybody in here get embarrassed because they've had a vision impairment? And don't be embarrassed. You can raise your hand. Remember, nobody can see you. So embarrassment because you may do things that you normally wouldn't do if your vision was good. You know, the classic example is going out to eat and you spill food on yourself. Or you think you ordered something and it came back something else. The other thing, and it's the least um, topic that we talk about when we talk about a vision impairment, is depression. Besides knowing the disease, it's the depression part of the disease, the disease that really affects people with vision impairment. It's a mindset. 
You know, we, it's so easy for us to become negative that we can't do something, that we forget about the positive things that we can still do. You know, and I can tell you sad stories of people who can't see at all or who are, you know, stuck at home in, in their own home and they've never been out for 20 years. So there are times when, you know, the grass always seems greener on the other side, or and there are times when the grass is browner on the other side, and you just have to decide which route you want to take. The other one is bargaining. Does anybody know what I mean by bargaining when you go through these emotions? Do any of you do that? Well, God, if you give me my sight back, I promise I'll go to church five times a week. Or, you know, if I can have my sight back, then I promise I will take all the old ladies out for lunch on Wednesdays. But that happens. You start to do this bargaining with yourself. And a lot of times you don't say it out loud, but internally you're doing these bargainings. And then the other one, which we just said a little bit ago, was acceptance. How many of you truthfully and honestly can say today, and raise your hand, that you've accepted your vision impairment? Very good. That's great. Because a lot of people will, will not accept it. A lot of people are fighters and they don't want to accept that they have a vision impairment. The biggest one of them all, though, is fear. And we kind of said that in the beginning. The biggest fear is, A, I'm going to go blind, or my family's going to do away with me, or they're going to throw me in a nursing home because I can't see. Or my friends aren't going to come around. They're not going to play cards with me. You know, I just was out at the table for the morning there, and I can't tell you how many people came up and bought cards because it's something that you can still do. You can still do that activity. It's just a different type of cards, just a bigger card. But a lot of people get that fear that, you know, my family, my friends, my church, people are not going to accept me because I, I'm different. And the biggest problem that we have is with the folks sitting in the audience today is you do not look visually impaired. If I brought somebody in right now on the top of this stage and said, you know, what do you think of these people? They would think that most of you have the 2020 vision and you can see them. Because as a society, what do we think of somebody that has a vision impairment or is blind? What do we think of them? How do we stereotype them? They usually have a, a white cane or maybe they have dark glasses or maybe they have a service dog or maybe they're hovered in a corner and nobody's paying any attention to them. So unfortunately, the, the side effect, I guess we could call it, with, with the vision impairment that you're dealing with is that you don't look visually impaired. So that's kind of hard when you walk into the grocery store or you're walking in the mall and Sally says hi to you and you don't know who that person is because you couldn't see them. And then Sally comes up to you later and says, Joan, I saw you in the mall and you snubbed me. How many of you have had that happen? Some of you, because you didn't recognize them. So that's one of the things, these are, whoops, I switched already. So the, there really is no reason to have fear, to, to remain independent, and you can remain independent. How many of you think you're not going to be able to stay independent? And is that because you feel because you can't see anymore, or that there's not going to be stuff, and I'll use the word stuff loosely, out there to help you. Anybody comment on that one? Hmm? Pardon me? You live alone now, and so you're afraid that if your vision gets worse, it's going to be harder for you to live alone? Okay. And it's hard to ask family members for help or neighbors? Okay. And again, that's a natural response. We like to be independent. We don't like to ask for help. When we, we're talking about the emotions, the biggest thing is trying to accept it and then be honest with yourself and the people around you. And you know, some of the things we talked about driving, you know, it's so hard to ask somebody to drive you, but switch roles. If you could, and you've probably done it in the past, somebody needed a ride, you would gladly take them for a ride or take them where they need to because we want to help people. Our biggest thing is always asking for ourselves. So those of you that are visually impaired and those of us that are not visually impaired, one of the greatest things that you can do for us, the non-visually impaired person, is ask for help. 
because that is how we feel that we can help you by doing something. Because we realize that we can't give you your site back, but it would make me very happy to take somebody to the store if they couldn't see. I would feel like I am doing something beneficial for them. So it's a two-way street. You can, you can actually make somebody else's life more rewarding, more humbling, if you just ask for a little bit of help. So the next thing that we have to do is you have to accept that you are a VIP. Now, does anybody know what a VIP is? All right, I've taught you well. A visually impaired person as well as a VIP, because you also are a very important person. And if you did not get your little wristbands out um, during the break, we have them out on the uh, macular vision research table, is the little white bands that have VIP in red on them. And that, again, is to identify that you're a visually impaired person or that you support a visually impaired person. And we've done quite a bit of um, work, especially in, in our neighborhood, of letting like our emergency response folks know, um, the bank people, the, the tellers, the cashiers, that if they see somebody with a wristband, that that kind of indicates to them that that person may have a vision impairment and that, that maybe they could be a little bit more helpful, a little bit more understanding. And we used the white and red. Does anybody know why we used white and red? Because it's the same colors that we use for the canes. Yes, the canes are white with a red tip. So that's kind of an indication or a color that we use in the field with um, vision loss. However, the ironic part is red is one of the colors, though, that most people with macular degeneration have trouble seeing. So we made these bracelets for the other people to see, not you to see. So then the next one is you have to embrace your vision impairment. Can't be embarrassed by it. How many of you wear glasses now? Are you embarrassed to wear glasses? Well, you wear glasses because you can't see. And so I use that analogy. A lot of people say, I'm not going to use a magnifier. I don't want, you know, Mrs. Jones to see me pull out my magnifier when I'm trying to look at something. Well, it's no different than trying to pull on your reading glasses because you've got to read something. You just have a more sophisticated device. That's what I tell people. You've got a better device. Then the next thing that we have to do is we have to be willing to relearn a new task or how to do an old task different. How many of you have learned to do something a little different than the way you used to? How many of you try to pour your coffee in the morning and spill it? See, I see some hands creeping up, but nobody wants to admit it. So how many of you have learned that when you're pouring your liquid, if you just stick your finger over the edge of the cup, and as you're pouring the liquid in, as soon as you feel it with your finger, you stop pouring? Anybody done that? A couple of you? Now, you would have never have done that before if you had, um, when your sight was good, but you've actually relearned or you've learned how to do something different, but you still accomplish the same thing. You're still able to fill that glass with the liquid. And then here's the most important one, is you have to be educated. How many of you have had to go out and educate yourself on your eye disease? So how many of you, when you were diagnosed, did the doctor say to you, oh, Sally, you have macular degeneration. Here's a book. Read it, and it'll answer all your questions. And how many of those books answered all your questions? So most of you had to go out and do your research and to educate yourself. How many of you are finding that you're still educating yourself? And one of the ways to educate yourself, obviously, is being at a seminar like this. But what other ways are you learning to educate yourself? Support, Support groups, good. What else? Ask questions. How many of you, and we'll go back to the ask questions. How many of you, when you were diagnosed with macular degeneration, as soon as you had it, all of a sudden, all these other people around you had macular degeneration? Did you notice that? It's like you never heard this word, and then all of a sudden, you have macular degeneration, and now you run into five people that have had macular degeneration. 
And then once you find out they have macular degeneration, how many of you kind of talked together and, and compared notes? Okay, is that one way you educated yourself? And that's usually how you do it. You kind of learn by talking to other people and their experiences. So the education process when you have a vision impairment is ongoing. It's constantly changing. You heard Dr. Sharpman talk about different changes that are coming in um, the medical aspect of it. You've heard Kim talk about some of the trials that are going on. So you constantly have to be updated and educated yourself, educate yourself. And then here's the next thing that you have to do. You have to get your arsenal of aids. Now, how many of you think that you can just get one magnifier and it's gonna solve all your problems? Or maybe I should re-ask that question. How many of you got or bought one magnifier and were disappointed because it didn't do everything you wanted it to do? And how many of you, when you decided, and I'm gonna use a magnifier as an example, how many of you decided that you wanted to get a magnifier and you walked into the, the doctor's office or the site center or magnifiers and more, and you said, I wanna read a newspaper, and you wanted us to pull out a magnifier that was the size of a tennis racket so that you could see. And then how many of you wanted to slap me when I pulled out the magnifier and it was only three inches for you to see? But you could see. You just couldn't see the way you wanted to see. And so one of the things that, that we have on our end when we're working with somebody that's trying to get this arsenal of AIDS, and the reason I say arsenal, because I'm gonna tell you this. When you have a vision impairment, we equate it to like shoes. Anybody know what I mean by like shoes? How many of you have one pair of shoes? How many of you have five pair of shoes? How many of you have more than five pair of shoes? Okay. So when you have a vision impairment, low vision, you are going to have to have lots of shoes. There are many different things that you're going to have to use to make it easier, less embarrassing, and more acceptable by using this arsenal of AIDS. So I kind of brought a little show and tell. I know most of you aren't gonna see it, but I, those of you that can see, How many of you have used a 2020 pen? Does anybody know what a 2020 pen is? I, I know some of you do. 2020 pens, when I look at our inventory and I look at all the stuff we sell, the 2020 pen is my number one selling item for $1.25. Now this little $1.25 little instrument can actually make a difference in somebody's life that has vision impairment. It's a silly little black marker but it does not smudge. It does not penetrate through the paper unless you stand there and hold it for about 10 seconds, then it may go through. But when you're visually impaired, you need to, when you're writing, you need things to be a little bit bolder, a little bit darker, and you need to be able to see what you're writing. And so a silly little 2020 pen can make a difference whether you're writing your check or you're writing a note to yourself or a greeting card or you're making the shopping list. How many of you made a shopping list and then you've got to the store and can't figure out what you wrote? So that makes it a little bit difficult. So a silly 2020 pen can be one of those things of, that belongs in your arsenal of AIDS. The next thing how many of you still do your own finances? How many of you still write checks? How many of you like to write checks? I have some stuff for you that you can write for me if you like to write checks. How's that? One of the things that we have difficulty with, and again, it goes back to the sense of independence, is most of us still want to keep our own finances to ourselves. It's very hard to share with somebody or have somebody else now take over that ability to write checks. So I didn't bring one with me, but you can get large print checks from your bank that makes it a lot easier for you to continue writing your checks. And then the other thing, again, I know you won't see this, but I'm just holding this one up, is a large print check register. Now, a lot of folks still, and I have to admit I do not do this anymore because I do all online banking, but a lot of people still use a check register and they still want to balance their accounts. But it's very hard if you've tried to use those little check registers that come with your checks. So sometimes something as simple as a large print check register 
can make a difference. So again, something large print is uh, considered one of our arsenal of aids. The other thing is little talking devices. How many of you have trouble seeing your watch or knowing what time it is? Or maybe the clock next to your bed or the microwave clock to see what time it is? Well, sometimes something as simple as It is 11.20 a.m. is a little pocket talking, um, this is a little talking keychain that actually just tells you the time. And you just push on the button. It is 11.20 a.m. And so whenever you need to know what time it is, it's in your pocket. Now, the only thing, the disadvantages we have with something like this, and, and we have watches, and we have little alarm clocks, all different kinds of things that talk, um, is that a lot of them we can't change the voice. And my favorite story that I like to tell is um, several years ago, I had a gentleman buy a talking watch. He was so happy at this talking watch. He could never see what time it was. About a week later, he came back to me and he's like, Debbie, he goes, I can't use this. And I said, what do you mean you can't use it? He goes, can you adjust the volume? And I'm like, no. I said, but you can't hear that? He goes, oh, no, I can hear it. It's just my priest can't hear it when I'm in church on Sunday. Well, he wanted his priest to hear, you know, if he was talking too long. So what I did was I told him, well, whatever you do, do not tell that priest where you got that um, talking watch because I don't want him coming after me. But... Again, it's a, it goes back to that sense of independence. If you can't see what time it is, it's a pain to ask somebody else, what time is it, what time is it? Or if you're like me who has insomnia and you can't sleep all night and you wanna wake up and you, or you wake up and you wanna know what time it is, it's easy to push the button. So something simple like that is also considered in your arsenal of aids. Then the next, usually most, prominent type of aid that we're going to use is a, is a magnifier. How many of you here use magnifiers? Okay. How many of you have more than one magnifier? Okay. How many of you have lighted magnifiers? How many of you have non-lighted magnifiers? Okay. Now, the difference is this. Typically with a low vision disease, and particularly with macular degeneration, we need more light to see. But it's more light on what we're doing, not necessarily in the room, but on the task that we're doing. So several years ago, when they started doing manufacturing of magnifiers, they started putting lights in them. Well, then what happened was some of those lights had little light bulbs in them, little halogen bulbs or, um, that had to be replaced. Well, the problem was that when you're visually impaired, it is very hard to see to replace those little bulbs. So most of our magnifiers today now have LED lights in them, which means we do not have to replace the light bulb. We just have to use batteries to run on it. So the problem, though, that most people don't realize is they'll go to the store and they'll walk into Mark's and they'll see this 99 cent magnifier and the magnifier says it's gonna magnify you know, 20 times. Well, they get it home and it doesn't work. Number one, for 99 cents, I can tell you it's made in China, so it's not gonna work. It's gonna have a little bit of distortion, if, if not a lot of distortion on it, and it's not gonna be strong enough because the typical magnifier that you're gonna buy over the counter typically is only a, goes up to three times magnification. Most of you with a vision impairment are going to need something usually about a three times or stronger. In some cases we can get a little bit less, but the most important thing is that you have it lit, a lighted magnifier. Now, the advantage to that is if you don't need the light, you can turn the light off. By using the light on a magnifier, it helps to get to the, the image to the back of the eye, to the retina, quicker and sharper, so it will make a difference. And if any of you have not see, checked out some of the magnifiers that we have out on the table, just go out there and look and try it without the light and then with the light, and you'll actually see um, some difference. So a lighted magnifier also is added to that large um, arsenal of aids that you're gonna be carrying. Then the other thing is, then we get to the point where, and we also have some out on the table there, electronic magnification. Your regular handheld magnifiers are um, a glass lens or a plastic lens. It's a specific power that's ground into that glass or plastic, just like your eyeglasses. But it's only good for a certain task. And when I asked a lot of you if you have more than one magnifier, you have different magnifiers and sometimes you have different powers. It depends on the task that you're doing. 
the upcoming thing, like everything else, technology is changing. And the big thing that we're seeing, the, the largest um, in, influx, is the electronic magnification. Because we're now using a camera versus a lens, so I can give you a larger screen or a larger viewing area. I still can't give you that tennis racket that you can see with an electronic uh, camera on it, but I can give you something that has maybe 22 inches of a screen size to help you see. The advantage to electronic magnifiers, and I say this and I predict this because I figure in about five years, just the handheld regular glass or plastic magnifiers will be pretty much obsolete. Because by using the electronic magnifiers, you can change the amount of magnification. So now we're not gonna have to have 10 pair of shoes. We might only need the one pair of shoes that's going to do everything. So the electronic magnifier can change magnifications. But the other thing that it can do that a handheld magnifier cannot do is we can change the background or the contrast. And a lot of you that have um, wet macular particularly what macular degeneration, are a little bit more sensitive to glare. And a lot of you will find we like the, the backgrounds to be black and the print to be white. And it's a little bit easier to see. I can't change your backgrounds with a handheld magnifier. But it, with an electronic magnifier, I can change the backgrounds. I can change the background color, so I have different colors. I can change the brightness. And I can also change the size, the magnification size. And then a lot of them with the electronic magnifiers, especially the portable ones, they have a freeze frame button. And I love that little freeze frame. It's particularly um, the perfect example I like to use is if you're looking up a phone number in a phone book. And you find it and you have your little handheld magnifier and you get it and you look at the number and you're like, okay, 946-336. And then you forget the last one by the time you get to the phone. Well, with the electronic magnifiers, I can kind of, it's basically taking a picture I freeze that image on my little electronic magnifier, and now by the time I get to the phone, I don't have to worry about forgetting that number because it's right there in front of me. Um, a lot of our diabetics use the electronic magnifiers because they have to check their blood uh, glucose levels or if they have to fill a syringe. It makes it a lot easier than trying to handhold um, a, a handheld magnifier. The one thing I can't give you, and we always joke about this in the office, is when you have a vision impairment, I cannot give you that third arm. And you know what I mean, because if you have to hold a handheld magnifier, you need that third arm to try to do something. I was just telling somebody out there, trying to write a check. You're trying to hold a magnifier and the pen and trying to write on the check can sometimes be difficult. So electronic magnification, you're gonna see more and more of that coming out in the, the near future. Again, we have some out on display out there, but I think that's what you're going to start to see is going to become the trend, and it's something that's easier for somebody who's visually impaired. And I will preface it in saying yes, though, it is more expensive than a handheld magnifier. However, if you took and added up all those handheld magnifiers that you've bought throughout the years or that you might have to buy, in the end, it's actually more cost effective to go with a, an electronic magnifier. Anybody in here use computers? And are you successful using a computer with vision impairments? Some of you? Okay. Some of you get frustrated? Okay. And for the sake of time, I, I'm not gonna go through all the things that are available, but, but there are many programs, software programs, that are available for the computer to make it easier for you to use. There are things just as simple as a large print keyboard can make it simpler. Now, technically, I always say that, but you know, we were taught to type that we weren't supposed to look at the keyboard, so it really shouldn't matter. But for most of us, we do have to periodically look at that keyboard. So a large print keyboard can also make it a lot easier for you to just use um, the computer. There are different um, uh, soft or hardware pieces that can also be added to a computer system. There are scanners that can be added. There are things that we call OCR, optical character recognition type software or devices. And that means that they will read back to you text to speech. They'll read the text, read it back to you. And, and again, there's, there's numerous amount of things that are available uh, for the computer. So what I'm trying to kind of get through to you is that when you have a vision impairment, you're gonna need your bag of goodies, your arsenal of aids, different things. And the one thing that I didn't touch on, and, and I had heard a question earlier, is that sunglasses um, and glare control. 
And that is a whole nother topic. I could keep you here till three o'clock on that one. But uh, glare control or different types of tinted lenses can make a difference depending on your vision impairment. So there's lots of things that go into that arsenal of aids. And so when I say that, everybody thinks I'm talking just about magnifiers. But it's just different devices, tools, that can make your life a little bit simpler or easier. So now what happens, you're living with your low vision and you're using all these aids. What, what's the next thing? What do you have to become? What, what type of um, personality do you have to become when you have this? Assertive. Assertive, that's a good one. What else? Curious, okay. Anybody else? Philosophical. Philosophical. Understanding. Proactive. Proactive. Stingy. stingy. <laughs> you become stingy, there you go. You have to be. How about becoming patient? How many of you have found that it is so hard to be patient? And you know what? You become impatient more with yourself than other people. And, do you, and, and why? Why do you become impatient more with yourself? Because you're getting frustrated? What else? Exactly. You cannot do the things you used to do. And the disease has affected your eyes. It has not affected your brain. And so your brain remembers that I used to be able to go out on the porch and take my newspaper and my cup of coffee and be able to read that newspaper, and in five minutes I was done. Now it takes me half a day to read the newspaper. So you become more impatient with yourself because your brain remembers how you used to do it. So what I tell people is that you have to become a patient person, not a person who's a patient. And that's the hardest thing to do when you have a vision impairment, is to become patient and do things slower. In the office, I usually tell people that they don't have low vision, they have slow vision. You still have vision, it's just a lot slower than it used to be. And it's a little bit harder than it used to be. But you have to be more patient. And sometimes, um, I won't point fingers to people, but sometimes it's the family member that becomes more impatient than it actually is the patient. Because, and it's not necessarily because they're trying to be mean or they don't understand, it's just they're frustrated for you and they know how you used to do something. So sometimes it's a little bit harder too for the caregiver or the family member to, to accept your eye disease than it is for you as, as the person with the eye disease. And then the other thing is, it takes lots and lots of practice every day forever. So every day you have to keep practicing, you have to keep reading or writing, whatever it is you're gonna do, but you have to do it. And again, you will actually pick up speed. I can tell you that once you get a magnifier, for example, and start reading, you will go back to, I call it first grade reading. How many have gone back to first grade reading? We, you have to read letter by letter, word by word. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can still read, it's just slower. But if you continue to use your magnifier or your electronic magnification, you will actually pick up some speed. And you're not gonna get back to you know, Evelyn Wood's speed reading classes, but you're still gonna be able to um, read a little bit faster than you were before. But again, it's practice. How many of you used to do um, play the piano or a musical instrument? And how many of you practiced just once and it worked perfect? You had to keep practicing over and over and over until you got it perfect. Regular eye exams. And I emphasize this because this is what we'll hear in the office. Well, the doctor told me there's nothing more that he or she can do for my vision, so why should I keep going back there? You still need regular eye exams. Number one, because we're still monitoring the health of your eye, because there are other eye diseases that can happen. But number two, if you don't keep going back, what if there is a new treatment that's out there and you don't know about it? So your eye doctor can also be um, a resource, a form of education for you to help you with your vision impairment. The other thing is inform your family members of your disease, and I call it a dis-ease. 
not a disease, but a dis-ease. You're uneasy with something. And the reason I say that is, is if you don't tell family members that you have macular degeneration, you know, again, you may have heard with Dr. Sharpman, and I'm not sure how much detail he went into, but um, macular degeneration can be hereditary. It can be genetics. And if you don't tell the family members, then they may not necessarily be on the lookout or tell their doctor that they have a vision um, disease in the family. So regular eye exams and telling family members is important. The next one is talk about it. Just like we kind of said here earlier when you run into other people that have a vision impairment or in a group like this, you know, ask the person next to you, you know, how are they dealing with their eye disease? And then the biggest thing is that remember you're not alone. You know, there's 14 million people that have vision impairments and there's probably more because a lot of people won't even admit that they have a vision impairment. So you're not alone. And by participating in support groups like this or supporting the Macular Vision uh, Research Foundation, you're, you're part of something. You're part of the future. You're part of hopefully finding a cure, helping somebody else. I know Keith talked about um, the website. And if you go on to their, the website, there's a lot of helpful hints. You know, talk about educating yourself. There are a lot of things on the website that will help you. Um, the other thing, and I, if you didn't pick it up, you can get, pick one up on your way out is, um, oops, right here it is, the newsletter. Macular Vision Research Foundation puts out a newsletter quarterly. And there's a lot of good articles in here, a lot of helpful hints, um, information about um, research that's going on. So again, it's keeping yourself educated. And it's free, guys, it's free, okay? So everybody likes that F word, free. So I kind of want to wrap it up and just let you know that, that you're not alone, that there are organizations, there are people, there are doctors, there are places out there to help you, and that you're not alone, and that there's no question that we can't help you with in some way, shape, or form. And so on behalf of Murphy, we wanted to thank you for your attention, and if there's any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Okay, the question is sunglasses. Which is better, an amber lens or a gray lens? Number one, the most important thing with sunglasses is that they are UV protected. They've got to have the ultraviolet protection in them. The color doesn't really make a difference as far as protection. The color is your perception, what you're looking through. However, I will tell you this, that most people with macular degeneration will prefer or see better with a amber colored lens or a plum lens for outside. The gray lens has a tendency to be a little too dark outside for somebody with macular degeneration. And earlier you heard me say that we need more light to see. Well, actually when we're outside, we need more light to see, we need less glare. And there is a difference between light and glare. But for the most part, I am going to find people using amber or plum lenses for outside. The other thing that you can add to that sunglass to make it even um, more beneficial to yourself is that it's polarized. A polarized lens is also going to help cut down more glare and allow you to see better. Okay, so the question is how do you find an ophthalmologist that is educated and knows how to treat somebody for low vision with glasses? It's, it varies. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, and it's a good thing Dr. Sharpman's not here, you throw something at me. Um, a lot of the ophthalmologists, they specialize in the treatment of the disease and the management of the disease. They may not necessarily do the refraction part of the disease. And refraction means where you actually try to figure out if there's glasses strong enough to help you. So some ophthalmology offices will do that, and you kind of have to ask them, does your ophthalmologist do refractions? Um, if not, an optometrist is more specialized in eyeglasses and finding the prescription to help you with uh, low vision. Again, it's kind of trial and error because you're going to have to ask them. And some doctors are afraid to prescribe something that's really strong. And then remember, the stronger we make your glasses, and this is what everybody hates, the stronger we make your glasses, the closer you have to hold everything and people do not want to hold things this close to read because for so many years you've held things out here. So again, we have to retrain you. But um, I would say an optometrist would probably be your best bet for the eyeglasses. Okay, his question is, are transition lenses good for UV? 
Yes, they are. The transitions are treated. They have the ultraviolet protection in them. However, I personally do not recommend transitions for somebody with a vision impairment just because of the change time that, that takes for them to adjust. And earlier, as I said before, you need more light to see better. And particularly when you have a vision impairment, you know, the classic example is you come from outside to inside and it takes you a while to, to adjust. And that's just because it's, it's actually a, a, a chemical process that happens in the back of the eye. And when you have a vision impairment, particularly a retinal disease, that process slows down a lot more. And so if you have transition lenses on, you get back into this dark environment, you have to wait for the lenses to change, and then you're also waiting for the, the process to happen. So I'm a big believer in not transitions, but wearing sunglasses over regular glasses, so that when you walk into some place, you can just take your glasses off and you can adjust quicker. But they are healthy for you, they will not hurt your eyes, and, and they're, they're a fantastic lens. I just don't prescribe them for people with um, vision impairments. The, the question is, she saw these um, glasses, they're, they're made by Foster Grant. They're, they're reading glasses and they have two little lights on the side. And I just started carrying them about a month and a half ago. And it does help because you have the light and it's directly on the reading material. They're great in restaurants. You know, they're great if you're in the closet and you're trying to figure out is this blue or black, this clothes. Um, they're great for that. The problem is they only go up to a certain power and in most cases that power is not strong enough for a lot of you that have um, a vision impairment. But they're great little glasses. I actually had a lady, funny story, she saw them, she liked them, but she didn't need the power. So she had me pop the lenses out just so she would have the little lights on there. And it worked, made her happy. Her comment is with transition lenses, her doctor told this, and, and we'll tell you this too, is a lot of the vehicles do have tinted windows. The chemical reaction that happens in transitions is actually from the ultraviolet, from the sunlight. So if you have tr uh, tinted windows, you're not going, the transitions inside the car are not going to be as dark as if I'm standing outside of the car in the sunlight. And that's just because that windshield um, does filter out some of the ultraviolet lights. We do have a website. The question is, do we have a website? It's a long one. Um, it's www.magnifiers, and with the spelled out A-N-D, more, M-O-R-E, dot net. So it's a really long word, magnifiersandmore.net. So the question is training. How do you find, so we call it rehabilitation. And so there are different um, doctors, there are different occupational therapists that can also do training. The Cleveland Sight Center does some training. I have some limited training that we do in the office. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, I would probably start with my doctor and ask him who he refers out to for their, their vision rehabilitation.